Senator Mike Stewart is our guest in studio today, candidate for Attorney General in the state of West Virginia. Mike, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in studio. It's always great to have someone from outside the area in the studio when they're around. No, I love it. I've got family in Enwood, and it's great to have a fellow state senator here with me this morning and a, and a prosecutor. Absolutely. And, uh, and I may join him to kill some of these things a little bit later. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> they're a danger. Farmers uh, are yeah. not fans of these things, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Mike, what brings you to the Eastern Panhandle today? Well, we're doing a little politicking, and uh, we're working hard. Uh, you know, I announced not long ago that I'm running for attorney general in the state of West Virginia. I was, for those who don't know anything about my background, I was the Trump co-chair in 2015, 2016, that successful campaign for President Trump. And then I went on to become the United States attorney for the Southern District of West Virginia. We had Bill Powell in the Northern District. Mm -hmm. I was in the Southern District. We had a pretty good record. I prosecuted two members of the state Supreme Court, one Republican, one Democrat. I was a bipartisan corruption buster. Uh, we took more than uh, we, we took enough fentanyl off the streets to kill more than 40 million people. You think about it, in a state of 1.75 million people, that's a lot of fentanyl. Largest Medicaid fraud in the history of West Virginia uh, takedown. More takedowns and, and door busts than any other U.S. attorney in, in the Southern District in terms of uh, history. Operation Saigon Sunset, 250 law enforcement officers on the street targeting 100 defendants in the city of Huntington. So we had a pretty good record, but why am I running for attorney general? It's because I carry a wallet in my pocket filled with the pictures of the victims of the opiate crisis. And uh, I spent too much time embracing the moms and dads at the point of their greatest grief. Uh, people like Melody Douglas and Joe Douglas who lost their daughter, Victoria. And this is the story we see all across West Virginia. And I think I can play a, an integral role. I understand the federal court system. We've got uh, a lot of federal pushback that's happening here in West Virginia. Patrick Morrissey's done a great job. I think we need to continue that effort. And uh, I think I'm the right person. I was built to be the U.S. attorney, and I think I'm built to be the attorney general of West Virginia. Give me your opinion on the settlements we've seen so far in regards to this opioid crisis in West Virginia with the drug companies, their distributors and manufacturers. Yeah, so on a per capita basis, uh, these aren't bad deals. I certainly want bigger deals. And so one thing I'll say is Patrick Morrissey and I are different guys in terms of the way we approach things. I'm a pretty hard charger in terms of the way I negotiate. Uh, but I don't want to judge those settlements. What I will say is we've got a first fund with over a billion dollars sitting in that fund. If we use those dollars the right way, we can make a substantial impact. But if we don't use those dollars the right way, we're going to continue down the same path we've been on, which is more and more folks falling into the challenge of substance abuse. On the issue of crime and crime fighting, listen, I believe in redemption second chances. I think we need as much treatment and, and getting back uh, to a normal life from folks who are struggling with substance abuse. When it comes, though, to the guys from Detroit and Columbus and Dayton, I'm a big fan of keep them locked up as long as possible. I know it's controversial. I ran ads in my last campaign that said, you know my solution to prison overcrowding? Build another prison. That doesn't mean folks who are struggling with substance abuse, we don't want them to get the treatment they need and get back to a productive life. Uh, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, grandmas, grandpas need this, and they need that, and our communities need that. But bad guys, they ought to be behind bars for a very, very long time. And if you target and ambush law enforcement, like what happened down in Mingo County not that long ago, uh, that poor officer had no idea what he was walking into, was literally ambushed. The guy's laying on the ground bleeding out. And the guy walks up to him, hits him with the butt of the rifle, and hits him so hard it busts the butt of the rifle. I think it's time we talk about the death penalty for those folks targeting first responders in West Virginia leading to death. Has the governor appointed members to the board yet for the distribution of these opioid funds? No, I think the process is ongoing, and I'm not, I, I'm not aware of whether the governor has made those appointments. Sometimes there's a lag between those appointments and what we know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that process is ongoing, but I know regionally we're making those appointments. Matt or Jason, do you know if the governor's made those appointments yet? He has uh, not. He has not, Matt? I haven't heard anything. But, I think that's but, accurate. But the regionals sh should be completed across the state. They, right. were, they were supposed to be completed by the 17th of this month. 
Uh, Mike, let's talk about the attorney general's position. I've uh, read that you would like to give criminal jurisdiction to the attorney general. I've talked to Patrick Morrissey about this numerous times, and uh, we've had many discussions about it in, in some cases where it might be a good thing and some cases where it might not be. Well, I don't think we should have carte blanche criminal authority for the attorney general. What I do think is that for state agency crimes, some areas that could be carved out uh, that I've... It's, First, let me say this. Just, I want to back up. I think our prosecutors are doing a great job across the state of West Virginia. This is not an effort or a proposal by Stewart to somehow carve into what our prosecutors are doing. They're doing a great job. Often, though, they're underfunded. They need more people to be able to prosecute these crimes. And crime is much more complex to prosecute today. I think the attorney general can play an integral role in prosecuting state agency crime. Workforce West Virginia crimes, unemployment fraud, things that emanate out of Charleston. And then when we talk about ethics and corruption, listen, there's certain crimes that will be prosecuted in counties when it comes to corruption, and they're doing that. But there ought to be a role played by the attorney general. There was just a poll completed which shows that 70% of West Virginians believe the attorney general should prosecute crime. I don't know whether that's because most people in West Virginia already believe the attorney general has that authority. They do. They do. And so I think it's common sense for most taxpayers. Taxpayers work hard, try to provide for their families, put their kids to school. They work hard every day. They don't have time to be consumed by politics. But they do assume that their attorney general, being funded by taxpayer dollars, is working 24-7 on every serious issue facing West Virginia that has a legal attachment to it. And when we had the special ed uh, situation in Berkeley County a couple of years ago, I'd have Patrick Morrissey on, and we would get comment after comment about why isn't he doing something to put these people in jail. And the answer is the attorney general doesn't have criminal jurisdiction. Matt Harvey. So, uh, Senator Stewart, do you, this is, you have some specific areas that you would want to seek criminal jurisdiction for the attorney general? Yes, I do. I do. And I, but, but I think this has to be done. You know, I have some experience serving as the U.S. attorney. And so one thing that I like the way the attorney, the, the U.S. attorney general's office worked with respect to prosecutors from across the country was there was an advisory council of, of U.S. attorneys from across the nation that worked directly with the U.S. Attorney General in terms of providing guidance and advice in terms of the way things could function better. I don't want this to be a role where we in any way infringe or impart or take away from prosecutors' uh, role to make decisions within uh, their boundaries of jurisdiction, those counties, where there become some issues that I think could be very useful for an Attorney General state agency crimes, things happening with state agencies, specifically in Charleston, but also with respect to the drug crisis when there are multi-county issues. Right now, the attorney general has authority when it comes to criminal appeals, which to yeah. me seems like an unusual thing, not involved at all unless requested to be involved at the beginning of these prosecutions. But in terms of criminal appeals, then it's up to the attorney general. I would love to see us sit down and work together because I think I've heard from a number of prosecutors from around the state uh, that, will, that will call me and say, I think what you're saying is something we need to talk about in terms of state agency crime, unemployment, fraud, those challenges that we see from a statewide standpoint. When you say state agency crime, doesn't the auditor's office already have a public integrity unit that investigates that type of crime? They can do that, but I think the bully pulpit of the attorney general, that person who can travel around the state of West Virginia as the attorney general, speak on these issues, bring some real force behind these issues. Well, you're not only a candidate for AG, but you happen to be a sitting state senator. Have you drafted any language on these so, so I, I think it would be inappropriate being sitting in the state Senate and making this proposal for a job. I think that uh, I have a good shot to win and we're going to work hard to do. I think it'd be more appropriate once I'm there to have these discussions with prosecutors. I don't think this is something where you flip the switch on. Uh, I think it's important that we ease into this, that we, that we get up to our ankles in the water before we dive in. And so I think this is uh, going to be a, a matter of regional discussions, personal discussions with leaders from the prosecution community around West Virginia. But I think it's important that this not be something the attorney general seizes, but there be some general 
uh, view from the legislature, the executive branch, and prosecutors across West Virginia as to the proper way this works. So based on that answer, I'm, I'm assuming you have, you have no clue of, of the financial impact that would have, the physical note. I think there's no question it's going to have a financial impact, but I don't know what those numbers are at this point. And so, but I will say this, that the attorney general's office, in terms of their budget, I think every attorney general and every office reprioritizes what they're looking at and how they're working on things. I've always been very good at managing budgets. I had a $12 million budget as U.S. attorney. Uh, in my final year, we brought in about $34 million. We were profit positive, one of the few areas of the federal government that was. And so I understand the impact of budgets. I'm very good at that. Started my career with PricewaterhouseCoopers. And so I'm a recovering accountant in, a in, in addition to being a lawyer. And I think it's very important that when we sit down and reprioritize what's happening at the Attorney General's office, we do so in a smart way. But let me also say this, though. I believe in tax cuts, and I voted for those, and Senator Baird has been a strong proponent of tax cuts. But I also believe there's areas where we need to invest and uh, in West Virginia. We can see here in the Eastern Panhandle the explosive growth. We need to be investing to make sure we can do everything we can with respect to that. But when it comes to crime, more law enforcement on the streets. We need it. Higher pay in terms of our prison guards and folks who work at our prisons, uh, the financial stability of our prisons. And I'm somebody who believes that the jail bill, which right now is saddling counties across West Virginia in a terrible way, uh, there are some counties where it's 90% of the county budget goes to maintenance of county jails and paying those fees. I think that bill should be in Charleston. Why? Because we have too many counties where magistrates directly or indirectly are making decisions based on whether we lock people up on the basis of what, how it impacts the county budget. I believe that whether folks are incarcerated and put behind bars here in Berkeley County versus Kanawha County, I think it affects them down there. And so it seems to me it makes a lot more sense for these budgets to be in Charleston, free up county budgets for county investment, and perhaps more investment in local prosecutors' offices. I will say this as I travel around. I know the view is the conservatives want to cut, 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 cut. My experience is they want to cut, but they want to invest and make sure their streets are safe and that, uh, and that crime is as low as possible and that we're prosecuting bad guys. This idea of a revolving door, I I'm not a hug-a-thug guy. If you're looking for a hug-a-thug guy for attorney general, that ain't me. Uh, if you want somebody who's going to be hard and harsh on crime, that's me, and that's why I think we need to play a bigger role in this. Well, and, and that's a hypothetical uh, position for the attorney general because the law hasn't passed. So currently, as the, as the office of the attorney general structured, what tools would you have at your disposal to help with some of the issues, and where do you think the priority would be? Well, so I can tell you that whether we have the authority or not, I'm going to use the bully pulpit of that office to do everything I can to try to, to turn the tide in terms of the fentanyl crisis and the drug crisis. Gosh, our schools across West Virginia, talk to school administrators, right? They have kids being suspended Every single 30 days, there's huge numbers. At any one 30-day period, there could be a 1,000 kids across West Virginia suspended, whether it's for vaping devices, marijuana, other things that we're finding in our schools. I'm going to use the bully pulpit as attorney general, with or without criminal authority, to speak on these issues and try to work with the local prosecutors to do all we can to increase the profile. But I will say this, federal overreach, it's my second highest priority. Those are the issues that happen in Washington where – Patrick Morrissey's done a great job on these issues, but we need an aggressive, unapologetic, unafraid, unabashed attorney general who's willing to fight these issues. Senator Jason Barrett. Well, Mike, uh, welcome to the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, a as we know, uh, one of our other colleagues is also running for attorney general, uh, Senator from Brook County, Ryan Weld. What type of campaign do you see uh, that between the two of you? Do you see this race as one that – each of you are going to put out your own ideas or run a positive campaign, or do you see this um, that could get a little aggressive and, and negative at times? So, so I love that question. And so I think there is a fine line between what we call a positive campaign and a negative campaign. I'm going to run, in fact, to this point, all we've done is talk about what my proposals are uh, if I become the attorney general and what I think the attorney general's office ought to be. But I think it is important. I think voting records matter. I don't think campaigning in terms of talking about somebody's voting record is negative. 
If a voting record is negative, it's negative on that person, right? They're the ones that cast that vote. There is a big difference, a big fundamental difference between my view of the world and my opponent's view of the world. I don't want to talk about what his proposals are for the office. He's a fine young guy. My point is simply that his voting record far different from mine. I think it's important we have a conservative, proven conservative in that role. And when you look at his voting record, and I'm, I'm prepared to talk about that voting record if you want, uh, but, but I think it's important. I think voting records matter. Here's what I say about voting records. They illuminate who you are. It's like human character. That's why diets fail all the time, right? Mostly. You can change your behavior for two or three months, a year, but typically you revert back to what your human uh, behavior typically is. You go back to the Doritos or the Twinkies. It's easy during a campaign to say you're a conservative. It's easy during a campaign to say you believe in this or believe in that. If you really want to know where people stand, look at their voting records. On the trans issue, listen, I'm very clear on this issue. I don't think boys should be playing girls' sports. I think it's uh, uh, there are a bunch of reasons, but primarily it's in respect of women and how hard we've worked to bring women's sports up and to build that issue of equality. I, I just don't believe in it. My opponent voted for that bill. Whatever reason it was, that's his reason. He gets to explain that. But we differ on that bill. On the COVID vaccine, uh, a, a bill came before the legislature. This is uh, before you were there, I believe, which said that if you don't get your COVID vaccine, you won't. He voted against unemployment insurance for folks who refuse the COVID vaccine. Listen, I just disagree with those positions. It's fine for him to have them. Uh, but to me, it's not negative campaigning by talking about voting records. That, that's simply a part of the discussion process, the decision-making process. One of the reasons I asked the question is because I think there was a comment that, that you said that his uh, that he was a wall in his support of former President Trump. Um, and that, that term, uh, you know, for someone that served in the military, um, you know, what, what would you say to a veteran that, that may cringe a little bit when they hear that term AWOL? Well, I th listen, uh, you can go back to 2015 and you... I, I challenge anybody who's listening. In fact, I challenge my opponent. And there could be another opponent in this race real soon. And uh, I would challenge anyone listening. Call me. I'll give you my cell phone number. If you can find any expression of support from my opponent for President Trump. Listen, I know people have different views on President Trump. I happen to be somebody who's endorsed him in this campaign. I think it's terrible we have a two-tiered justice system happening in Washington. It breaks my heart. I revere the Department of Justice. Uh, but in 2015, I was the first to endorse President Trump uh, as a policymaker in West Virginia. I chaired that campaign. I think President Trump's policies were great for America. I think we live in a time where being timid is dangerous for families. And so I challenge anyone listening to this radio broadcast to go back and find any expression of support or any endorsement by my opponent or my next opponent, whoever that happens to be, of support for President Trump. And listen, I'm not going to say that's a bad thing, but I think voters need to know. I think it ought to go into the decision-making process. I've been very clear where I stand. I'm opinionated. I have folks who love me and folks who hate me. That's fine. I'm not trying to get to 100%. I think if you have folks sitting at this desk right now trying to get to 100% support, uh, that's not who we want. I'm trying to get to 50% plus one. I want to take strong positions in defense of folks. I'm unapologetically conservative. I support President Trump and his agenda. And I think that's the right move for America in 2024. Um, with, you know, and I don't know who that third candidate potentially could be or fourth or anyone else, but as of right now, there are two of you. One from yeah. kind of, you're from the Canal Logan area. Uh, he's from the Northern Panhandle. There are a lot of Republican primary voters in the Eastern Panhandle. Can you talk about what your message is to those voters? Specifically, you know, a lot of Republicans down here you want to hear more than a noun, a verb, and Donald Trump in a sentence. So how do you how do you reach out to the Eastern Panhandle voters that are that are very much different and view themselves differently than other folks in the state? So I think these these voters, I tell you, when you travel and you know this because you go between this region of West Virginia and Charleston in your service to the state, there's dramatic difference, right? If you go Flatwoods and South and West Virginia, we're still losing population. Growth is remarkable. When you say I'm from Kanawha County, Logan County, that's true today. But heck, I spent 25 years in Morgantown. 
right? All my buddies, high school, Morgantown High School. Uh, my wife is from Fairmont, Marion County. My extended family's from Barber County. That's, that's really my roots. We spent the past few days at Morgantown and Fairmont and Clarksburg just meeting really with old friends. I think it's very important that the people of the Eastern Panhandle understand I'm not a creature of Charleston. I'm not a creature of Charleston. I will say it again, I'm not a creature of Charleston. I think we need to uh, release the shackles of places like Charleston on places like the Eastern Panhandle. The growth is remarkable. Even as I drove here this morning, you can see development after development after development after development. This is the engine of growth for West Virginia. I think when we talk about issues of being able to pay folks what, they're, what, what they deserve and how we can recruit and retain, law enforcement's a great example. We've talked about this before. We're competing here in the Eastern Panhandle directly with Pennsylvania, directly with Virginia. We have to be competitive in these salaries, whether it's for teachers, but those salaries are different when you look at Southern West Virginia. It's an interesting state, right? We've got these different regions where you have effectively economic depression in southern West Virginia, you could say. And here you've got this explosion of riches is the way I would look at it. It's remarkable. Everybody needs to pat themselves on the back. Now, with that comes real challenges. I'm sure from a prosecutor's office, you, you've just got an explosion of riches in terms of some of the bad stuff. You've got folks coming in. You've got to monitor things. These are big challenges for you. But I say this, I'm not going to be a guy who says, hey, we're going to focus this on Charleston. I think that's the problem we have. We need to focus things on the eastern panhandle, places like Martinsburg, Shepherdstown. What is it they need to grow? And I'm a big believer in local government and local decision making. I don't like cram down government. And so my point would be to the eastern panhandle is take your power, right? Because it really is remarkable what happens up here. It's exciting. In fact, you can probably tell the energy in my voice. I didn't need coffee this morning because it's exciting to see the growth. It's exciting to see the growth. Hey, Mike, before we run out of time, uh, I want to ask you a question because you brought up the death penalty a moment ago. Delegate yeah. John Overington served, I think, 34 years out of the Eastern Panhandle. When the Republicans were in the minority, he brought up the death penalty just about every session. When the Republicans took the majority, he didn't bring it back up again. When it might have passed, it might not have, but at least the Republicans had the majority at the time. Will you bring that up in the next session as a bill? Yeah, so we're working on that bill right now. Listen, I think this is important. I, I, I came late in my life to this issue. I was one of those folks that, listen, I, I believe in the protection of life. And, and there was a point in my life where I said it has to be at the beginning and at the end. But I think there's certain heinous, despicable crimes where you forfeit that right. Uh, what happened to Sergeant Maynard, and I carry a picture of him in that wallet filled with those pictures of the victims of the opiate crisis. There are certain despicable crimes where it needs to be on the table. Will we actually use it in West Virginia? I don't know if we ever use it, but it needs to be on the table. It needs to be one of those discussion items. Seventy-four percent of West Virginians in the most recent uh, 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 poll that was taken on the issue support it. I think it's fair for us to discuss it. I've had calls from across the country on this issue, but... I'm one of those folks, like I said, I'm not a hug a thug guy. I think we got to get tough on crime, tough on crime. We need to love those folks uh, that, that need second chances, that need drug treatment and substance abuse help. But those folks coming in from Columbus and Detroit and Dayton and those other places, we ought to be extra hard. And if you target law enforcement or first responders in the process, it's fair to have death penalty on the table. And let me say this, the fentanyl that's killing our kids, some states use that for the death penalty. Heck, you even have South Carolina that uses the firing squad. And so I think we ought to have a broad-based discussion on this issue. But the people of West Virginia are ready for it. And it doesn't mean these extended long periods of expense. Mike Stewart, thank you so much. Matt, I'm sorry we are out of time. Um, how do you find out more about Mike Stewart's campaign for attorney general? Thanks, because I always forget to do that. MakeWVGreatAgain.com. MakeWVGreatAgain.com. It's Mike Stewart. S-T-U-A-R-T. -T. Everybody spells it wrong. I don't care how you spell it. But go to MakeWVGreatAgain.com. Have a great day, sir. Thank you. Enjoy.